Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to continue reading Eva Abotson's The Journey to the River Sea. This book is illustrated by Kevin Hawks and published by Puffin Books. We're gonna pick up where we left off on chapter 21 after Finn and Maya have escaped up the river in the boat Arabella. Chapter 21. Miss Mitten was staying at the Kaminsky's. She had lost everything in the fire except her trunk of books, but with her butterfly money, she had bought a few things she needed. Because the Kaminsky's had been kind to her, she was determined to do her duty, so each morning she taught Olga and helped the Countess with her letters. The rest of the day, she searched for Maya. It was now a week since Maya had vanished. Miss Mitten had always been thin, but now she looked like a walking skeleton. When she passed through the streets, people turned to look at her anguished face. The Carter servants, Tappy, Furo, and the others, had not returned. When they had news of the fire, old Lila had fallen ill with a raging fever, certain that they had killed Maya by leaving her, and they had gone further into the forest to search for a medicine man who could cure her. But Miss Mitten went to talk to the native people living along the riverbank and by the docks. She, sh she searched the ruins of the bungalow again and again. She questioned the river patrols and the people who came in on the ships, in case Maya had lost her memory and wandered off. Many people helped her. The Kaminskys, Sergei in particular, the chief of police, the Haltmans, Madame Duchamp from the, from the dancing class, and the children who studied with her. In the short time that she'd been in the Amazon, Maya had made many friends. But the person who stopped Minty from losing her reason was Professor Glastonbury. Every morning he left the museum in charge of his assistant and searched for clues. The professor alone was all certain that Maya was not dead. There are almost always remains, he said, when someone burns to death. You mean bones or teeth, asked Miss Mitten? That is what I mean, said the professor firmly. He worked with the chief of police and the count. He spent hours at the docks, and at least twice a day he came back to see that Miss Mitten had eaten something or even slept. But when a week had passed, Miss Mitten had gave up hope. Now she must cable Mr. Murray and tell him that Maya was dead. She felt she had as good as killed Maya by deserting her. She put on her hat to go to the post office when the Kaminsky's maid showed in the professor. As soon as she saw his face, Miss Mitten reached for a chair. Is there? Yes, there is news. A man in a trading canoe on the Aragapi saw the Arabella, and he was certain that two children were aboard. Miss Mitten looked around the Kaminsky's drawing room as though she would find there the powerful boat that she needed ready and waiting. I must go at once. We must go at once, said the professor. The countess waited, begged her to wait for the husband, for her husband's return. He could find you a good boat and a crew. But waiting was not something that Miss Mitten could do. I'm going to need to buy some supplies and a few things Maya might need, she said to the professor. I'll meet you at the docks in an hour. But when they reached the harbor, there was no boat to hire and no one to help them. It was midday and everyone had gone home for lunch and for the afternoon sleep which followed it. Well, we will have to steal them, said Miss Mitten. And then they saw a boat that they knew. The Carter's Launch, the Spanish-colored boat without a name. Gonzalez had brought it down after the fire to sell and to help clear Mr. Carter's debts. No one will miss it for a few days, said Miss Mitten. And if they do, it doesn't matter. She looked at the professor. Can you manage her? I expect so, said, the, said Professor Glastonbury. He sighed, but he didn't try to stop her. It would have been like trying to stop an avalanche. There seems to be enough wood stacked up for now. Miss Minton had already picked up her skirts and jumped aboard. Now she took up the boat hook and waited while the professor fed the furnace with woods and the engine spluttered slowly to life. If we find Maya, said Miss Minton as they set off, I swear that I will give this boat a proper name. The journey they took up the Negro and into the Aragapi River was very different from the dreamy voyage Finn and Maya had made the week before. Faster, can't we go faster? Miss Minton kept saying. When their supply of wood ran low, she jumped ashore grasping the machete which Vero had left with the other tools, and slashed her way through the undergrowth as though she had been born with a knife in her hand. Everything she had forbidden her pupils to do, she did herself. Thinking gloomy thoughts, going off into black daydreams. One minute she thought that Maya had died in the fire, and the child seen on the Arabella was a native girl to whom Finn had given a ride. The next she thought that it had been Maya, but now that she had drowned or had reached the Zanti who had killed her. You couldn't blame them if they had had turned violent, she said, the way that some of these tribes have been treated. Yara was a gentle soul, said the professor, Finn's mother. 
That was then, said Miss Mitten. The professor left her alone and gave his mind to the boat. The launch was larger and faster than the Arabella, but this only meant that she needed more wood. He had taken off his shirt, his chest was covered in soot, and his face was crimson from the heat, but he pushed the boat on like a mad magician. But when Miss Mitten tried to make him sail on through the night, he put his foot down. It's dangerous and foolish, he said. If we run aground, we'll never get her off. So Miss Mitten lay down in the cabin, and the professor lay down on the deck, and as soon as the first light came, Miss Mitten made black coffee so strong that it almost took the roof of their mouths, and then they were off again. I was an idiot, she said, sitting in the stern with her hand on the tiller. I should have stayed with Henry Hardington, who pushed puppies through the wire mesh of tennis courts, or Lavinia Freeman, who, pl who plucked the wings off butterflies. Goodness knows, I've had enough awful children to look after. But Maya... They saw things that the professor would have loved to stop for. A deserted hummingbird nest with two eggs, no bigger than peas. A scarlet orchid, which was new to him, but Miss Mitten could not bear him to halt the, bo the boat. Even if a giant sloth with long red hair had come lumbering down to the water's edge, she would have insisted on going. But he did not let everything pass. He did not let everything pass. Do you have to go on calling me Professor Glastonbury, he complained, when they had been traveling for three days. Miss Mitten was staring, looking for signs of sandbanks or submerged rocks. I don't know your Christian name, she said. The prof professor blushed. It's Neville, he admitted. Miss Mitten turned to look at him. Oil-stained, unshaven, dripping with sweat, and woke up to what he was doing for her. What's wrong with Neville, she said. And after that, she became calmer and more sensible. She opened some of the tins that they had brought and made proper meals. She even allowed herself to see the beauty of the river and remembered how once she had hoped to make a living as a naturalist. You won't lose your job because of this, she asked, going away so suddenly. The professor shrugged. Probably not, but it doesn't matter much if I do. I'd have to retire anyway in a couple of years, and I have a bit of money saved. He put another log of wood into the firebox. Used to go on trips with tra Tavener sometimes. Could make a living like this. It's not just collecting. People pay good money now to be shown wildlife. He stared out over the water. It was what I meant to do when I came out here, but my wife didn't care for traveling. They turned into the Aragapi and soon afterwards saw a great snake, endlessly long, rustling through the leaves and dropping down into dark water. It's an anaconda, said the professor. Is it dangerous? asked Miss Mitten. Not to us, said the professor. It's a good omen, the god of the water making himself known. Then perhaps we'll find her, said Miss Mitten, under her breath. What do you mean to do with Maya when you do find her? Take her back to the Kaminsky's and never let her out of my sight again, said Miss Mitten. She may not find it easy. Why on earth not? The Kaminsky's are the kindest people in the world. Yes, but she has tasted freedom. That's neither here nor there, snapped Miss Mitten, whose corset was sticking to her back. I've tasted freedom too, she found herself saying, but I have to go back and so does she. Now they had to remember the route that Finn had meant to take, but lack of sleep and anxiety were beginning to make them clumsy. And there was another worry. The draft of the Carter boat was greater than that of the Arabella. What if the river became too shallow for them to go on? By the fifth day, Miss Mitten had secretly given up hope, and even the professor had stopped trying to be cheerful. Then, just after a week after they had set off, they grunted a bend and heard the barking of a dog. The children turned and saw the spinach green boat coming towards them. Oh no, not the Carter, said Maya. She looked down desperately for somewhere to hide. If I ran off into the jungle... But it wasn't the carter. In a way, it was worse, because from the woman who now rose on her seat in the stern, she would not have tried to run or hide. You're mad, shouted Miss Mitten across the narrowing gap between the boats. You're completely mad, Maya. What do you mean by this? And then she disappeared into the cabin where, for the first time since Maya had been lost in the fire, she burst into tears. But the relief of seeing Maya safe soon turned a, took a different turn. Aboard the Arabella, she complained about Maya's tangled hair, her bare feet, her strange clothes. She had brought a toothbrush, even a hairbrush, but as she said, it would take days to get Maya to look civilized again. She berated Finn for taking Maya off, she inquired nastily about his Latin, and wanted to know how often they took their quinidine pills. By the time she finished nagging and finding fault, Maya was almost ready to wish that Minty had deserted her. Later, the children went over to have supper on the Carter's launch. The professor, who turned out to be an enthusiastic cook, had opened a tin of corned beef and had made a splendid hash with wild onions and peppers. 
Finn, who had always admired the professor, had brought over some specimens for him to identify, and it was now that they heard what happened to the Carters. It's rather an amazing story, said Miss Mitten. Lady Parsons actually cabled and offered them a home. You could imagine how pleased the twins were, going off to live with a proper lady. Maya was surprised. She always seemed to be such a fierce person in the paintings. That square face and her choker of pearls. Well, she's certainly done her duty, said Miss Mitten. They sailed away just before we came. Did Mr. Carter go too, said Finn. Miss Minton took her head. He has to stay in the hospital for a while. He's probably sorry because what faces him when he comes out will not be pleasant. And she explained about the trial and what would happen if he was found guilty. But the talk soon turned to the Kaminskys. I'm sorry you never got my note that night, said Minty. I was arranging for us to go and live with them. You'll like that, won't you? She asked Maya. Maya was silent, looking down at her plate. Of course she will, jeered Finn. Sergey will be able to kneel at her feet like a person in a book. Miss Minton quelled him with a look. The Kaminskys have been kindness himself, itself. They have prepared a room for Maya at the top of the house with a view of the river. But Maya did not want to look at the river. She wanted to be on it. The grand house, the rich food, the Russian babble meant nothing to her now. She wanted to be with Finn and free. Do I have to go back? She asked quietly. Yes, first thing tomorrow morning, said Miss Mitten. Bring your belongings as soon as you've washed. Knowing it was her last night on the Arabella, Maya fought against sleep. She must remember it all. The lapping of the water against the side of the boat, the white moths, the fireflies... Finn, too, was awake. When we're grown up, I'll come back for you, I promise. No one can stop us then. But she wasn't grown up, and nor was he, and Finn was going on alone. The professor had tried to persuade him to come back with him, but Finn had only said, I promised my father I'd go and find the Zanti. I promised. Though, now lying in the dark, he realized how much he hated the idea of going on himself. He wasn't afraid exactly. He knew he could do it, but suddenly it seemed utterly dismal to go on without his friend. We could still run away in the forest. But my Finn said no. Minty really cares about you. But the professor told me she nearly went mad when she thought that you had been killed. You can't play tricks on her or on him. They're good people. It's just... Why can't grown-ups understand that we might know what's right for us just as well as they do? The children slept at last, but on the boat without a name, Miss Minton lie awake. After a while, she got up and went out on the desk, the deck. Everything had turned out as she had hoped. She had found Maya. Maya was safe and well. Not only safe and well, but happy. At least she had been. Finn, too. They had kept their boat tidy, labeled their specimens properly, taken their quinanine. Bernard would have been proud of his son. So why did she feel so uncomfortable? Behind her, behind her the professor stirred in his sleep. Are you awake? She asked him. He opened his eyes. I am now. I need to talk to you, said Miss Mitten. I'll go and make us some tea. The children slept late and washed and dressed almost in silence. Both of them were afraid to speak. Maya packed her belongings in an old canvas bag and stroked the dog. I'll come over in a minute and say goodbye, said Finn. The carter's boat was ready to leave. Breakfast tidied away and ropes coiled. The professor was sorting out the firebox and feeding it fresh logs. Miss Mitten, sitting in the stern, had a parcel wrapped in burlap over her knees. I'm ready, said Maya, trying to keep her voice steady. She mustn't cry, and above all else, she mustn't sulk. Ben's coming over to say goodbye. No need, said Miss Mitten. He'd like to. All the same, there's no need. Maya looked at her governess. Miss Mitten seemed different. Softer, rounder, more at peace. Why, she asked. Why is there no need? Because we're coming with you. We're going on. Get back in the, on the Arabella and tell Finn that will follow three lengths behind. As Maya turned to go, hardly believing that there could be such happiness, she heard a loud splash. Miss Mitten was leaning over the side, watching the parcel she held on her knees, floating away downriver. What was that? asked Maya. Miss Mitten straightened herself. If you not, must know, she said, that was my corset. Chapter 22. Now, Beatrice, boomed Lady Parsons, how often have I told you that Kiki's jacket must be buttoned up right to his little neck? You don't want the little doggy to catch a chill, do you? Beatrice glared at the shivering animal, standing on the hall table getting ready for his afternoon walk. Beatrice did want him to catch a chill. She wanted him to catch a chill, and then pneumonia, and then die. But she said nothing and did up the top button of the, tar button of the tartan waistcoat that he always wore for his afternoon walk, since he did not have enough hair or scents to keep warm. 
Now the lead, ordered Lady Parson, and Beatrice fetched the lead and clipped it on while Kiki snapped at her fingers. There you are, my little treasure, said Lady Parsons to the dog and to Beatrice. Now you're going to take him at least three times up and down the promenade. I shall know if you've only taken him twice, because Mrs. Tandry will be looking out of the window, and he must not be allowed to sniff at other dogs. It was a gray, windy day. The waves beat drearily on Littleford's gravel beach, but there was nothing to be done. Since they arrived in England, Beatrice had to walk Kiki every afternoon, and Gwendolyn had to walk him every morning. While well, Beatrice tugged at the little dog sulkily along the windswept beach, Gwendolyn was in the pantry pouring boiling water into Lady Parsons' stone hot water bottle, ready for Lady Parsons' afternoon sleep. When she had finished, she'd carried it upstairs to the big bedroom with its turkey carpet and lace-covered tables and the pictures of Sir Hector Parsons, who had been shot by mistake in Kenya while trying to shoot lions. She hurried downstairs now. She could get half an hour look at a comic she had found in a kitchen drawer before it was time to lay the tree, the tea. Gwendolyn, came Lady Parsons' angry voice from the bedroom. Come back here at once. How many times have I told you that the bottle must be wrapped in my shawl? Do you want me to burn my feet? Gwendolyn did want it. She wanted it as much as Beatrice had wanted the little dog to get pneumonia. But after nearly a month in Lady Parsons' house, she knew she was helpless. The Carters were penniless and there was nowhere else to go. I hope I, I hope I don't have to tell you which of my shawls the bottle must be wrapped in. No, Lady Parsons, it's the violet cro crocheted one and the second drawer down. Well, if you know, why don't you do it straight away, said Lady Parsons, and tell your mother to hurry with turning in the collar on the blue velvet. I'm going to wear it for my bridge party tonight. But as the girl left the room, Lady Parsons leaned back on her pillows with a satisfied, satisfied sigh. The girls were slow and they were stupid, but they could be trained and so could their mother. She had been right to take them. Lady Parsons was a widow and rich. She was also quite amazingly miserly. Saving money uh, was a passion of hers, and when she could see her bank balance swelling, she felt a deep happiness that nothing else could give her. Her husband had left her Grey Gables, which was definitely the largest and showiest of all the houses on the promenade. He had left her a big garden and a gazebo and her private bathing hut on the front. She was a healthy, middle-aged woman who could do anything she liked, and that's exactly what she did. She saved. When she first read the letter from Miss Carter, telling her that Clifford was in trouble again and that they were penniless, Lady Persons had been annoyed. What did the Carter's difficulties have to do with her? Mrs. Carter might be her second cousin twice removed, but that didn't give her a right to bother her. But then Lady Persons had a brilliant idea. Her personal maid, the one who helped her to dress and did her hair, kept her clothes in order, was getting old. She would sack her, and she would also sack the paid companion who came to take the dog out and wind her knitting wool and read to her. She would train the carters to do the work. Not only would it save two whole wages, but there would be no need to give carters free time or Sundays off, which servants always seem to want these days. As for Mr. Carter, who was on his way to prison in Brazil, he would, of course, never be mentioned or allowed to darken her doors again. So far, the plan had worked well. She had made a sitting room in the basement where the family could sit when she didn't want them, and sometimes when she drove out, she took Beatrice and Gwendolyn or their mother up beside her in the carriage so that her friends could see how kind she had been to take them in. Aren't you grateful to dear Lady Parsons, friends would say as she stopped the carriage to bow to them, and the twins would grit their teeth and say yes, indeed they were, but the moment they got home, they were set to work again. The jobs she found for them were endless. They had to match her embroidery wool, bring up her breakfast tray, and feed Kiki on steak cut exactly into half-inch cubes. They were sent to the shops in all weathers, mostly to the chemists, to fetch medicines for whatever she thought might be wrong with her. They had to tie her underclothes drawer, tidy her underclothes drawer, and hook up her bust bodice, and Mrs. Carter had to darn Lady Parsons' stockings and take up her hem and trim her hats. At night, the Carters were so tired that when a black beetle walked across the floor of their basement sitting room, Mrs. Carter did not even trouble to get the spray from the pantry. One of the jobs the twins hated most was reading out loud. They were poor readers. They read slowly, and they stumbled over words, but since Lady Parson was used to being read out loud as a way of getting to sleep, she did not mind. Beatrice had to read the whole of Ivanhoe, and Gwendolyn read a different library romance each week without taking in a single word. And at breakfast, when they read aloud from the newspaper, which was how they found out what happened to Maya, and Miss Mitten after they left. Beatrice was reading out the society pages and what King Edward was doing that evening when she saw something on the opposite page was 
which was printed in the foreign news. She stopped reading, gaped, and then read with her finger under the lines to make sure she had read properly. Well, has the cat got your tongue? asked Lady Person sharply, looking up from her coddled egg. But Beatrice was so startled that she went on goggling at the article. Then she said, it says here that Maya and Miss Mitten and that fat professor had vanished into the jungle. Maya went off with some boy or other in a boat, and Miss Mitten and the professor went after them to bring her back, and everyone has disappeared. Please, Lady Parsons, I must show this to Mama and Gwendolyn. Beatrice did not run, but she ran now, holding the newspaper and taking no notice of Lady Parsons' bleats. Mrs. Carter read the whole article aloud. It seemed that Maya and Miss Mitten had been missing for some weeks, and a search party had been sent out to look for them. The part of the country in which they were last seen is inhabited by savage tribes, some of them cannibals, not to mention jaguars, pit vipers, caimans, and other dangerous predators. It is feared that some serious harm may have befallen the party. So they did survive the fire, said Miss Carter. They had left Manus when Maya was still missing. Well, it serves her right if she gets put in a cooking pot. She always liked the Indians better than anyone. Now, Beatrice, said Mrs. Carter, you mustn't say such things. Well, we won't say them, said Gwendolyn, but nothing can stop us thinking them. And all that day they gave the dog his worm powders and ironed Lady Parsons handkerchief and sewed the pom-poms back onto her bedroom slippers. Their small, tight mouths were suddenly curved into a smile. It might be awful here, but at least we won't get eaten, said Beatrice. And Gwendolyn agreed. That's where we're going to stop for today. Join us tomorrow to finish Journey to the River Sea by Eva Abotson, illustrated by Kevin Hawks and printed by Puffin Books. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.